studies will combine uh, social linguistic and experiments like that. But, uh, and forgive me if, I, if you said it and I missed it. I probably it. didn't. Were there any context? Because uh, the social linguist in me asked, where did I see those people? Uh, in which context? What, their, what is their background? So, is this uh, Balbin, a third generation, uh, Gambrit in the Gambrit land? And I don't know, I need some background information and context in it somehow. No, the answer is not much, though, and I didn't talk about this. Um, we said a little bit like you're on a distant planet, the Balbins and the three bits of the. I, I forget that's actually what the story was. We had like a little sort of paragraph of a sort of story, but no, we didn't have a lot of context about. The individual Bulbeans or about the story of the Bulbeans and so on. And that is something that would be really interesting to bring in, I agree. I think it would be kind of nice and you might, I mean, we basically want to keep it fairly um, short and neat, but I absolutely yeah. agree. But I think you, this can't be uh, studied isolated somehow, so isolated from the context and the social background. Mm -hmm. But yeah, really no, I know it's, it's true. There's, there's going to be, I mean, we talk about controlling for the social with social with expectation of participants, but of course, some of that is going to feed in. There's going to be some things that participants bring with them to the lab. So it's really a matter of trying to minimize that and reduce it as much as possible. Yeah, uh, for Chelsea, I, I was wondering whether you had thought about um, moving from homophones to cases of polysemy, where uh, it's you know, arguably those are not going to work quite the same way, but it would be interesting to find out. And actually, some of your examples, if you prime them, could easily be turned into cases of polysemy or what is sometimes called autohypomony. So if you showed uh, the subjects pictures of jaguars, lions, tigers, and cheetahs, and then had them do cat, where that brings out the the use of cat for these these large cats. Uh, we even talk about cats and kittens. So you know, if you have grown-up cats and, and little kittens, then maybe in that context, cat. It's not that it's a homonym, but that it has these different senses, and they then react accordingly. So I'm, I'm not sure whether um, you know. I guess so. So there's really two questions there. One of them is. Uh, polysemy versus homonymy slash uh, homophony. And the other is whether priming would affect responses, especially in these cases of, um, of overlap, uh, where one sense is uh, subsumed in the other. I think potentially you could expect an effect, basically for the patterns of responses where you get an effect that basically seems to amount to people's knowledge of the lexicon. Mm -hmm. So I think you'd probably want to get lower accuracy because it's close enough to ceiling that it's hard to get effects. So one thing I did look at was if you look at homographic homophones versus non-homographic mm -hmm. homophones and didn't find an effect. But there, I mean, it's hard because it's probably going to be a sort of subtle effect. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if you made like more phonologically ambiguous things or added in noise or something if you might be able to pry apart those effects because it seems like you could get that based on the salience of how likely are people to want these sure. to be two distinct items that happen to be pronounced the same versus are they things that we really register as being yeah, you know, the maybe variants of the same like these metaphorical somewhere. extensions the yeah. and you show someone a yeah. picture of a clock and then you do and and does that, you know, yeah. cause them to... Yeah. But what, sort of, based on how you started, I thought you were going to ask about, do homophones pressure us towards semantic change instead of sound change? Well, that's, um, yeah, that's, because that's, that's another... Because that's, I think we definitely have evidence for that, that if you have two words that are pronounced the same, we're more likely to interpret them as basically being variants of the same thing. Mm -hmm. So you'll get things like, you know, light and color versus light and weight have different right. origins, right. that sort of have ended up being treated as being... Yeah, the other day I gave an example of ear, ear of corn, which is a natural mm -hmm. thing to imagine to be a metaphorical extension. Right. Uh, but it is not historically, but that doesn't really matter. Yeah, so lots of these examples where it seems like we sort of reframed them in these sorts of ways where we try yeah. to treat them as the same, or like, you know, to sap someone's strength versus sap of a tree. Not actually related, but right. people mm -hmm. try to frame these in these ways where it's related. And you also get it with not perfect homophones, but things like you know, the shift of what 
bemused means. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you definitely get that, which maybe fits into yeah. you know, what happens when we have... Or he was reticent to, to... That's almost completely shifted over so that that's widely used yeah. uh, as opposed to yeah. uh, where it was influenced by reluctant and by the meaning. Yeah. So this is a question for Gareth. Um, your task had people cooperating, and if we go back to good old Howie Giles and his buddies on accommodation, they would expect dis, um, uh -huh. di with disaffiliated pairs, that is, people who are trying to compete in some way, or I, I hate you or something, what would you expect in your experiments? Yeah, because oh, is there even a way to do your experiments that way? I, I, mean, I think you can. So um, I'm going to have, have to experiments where you have. Um, oh, we, we did something a bit different. There's some work with um, Betsy Sneller where we had um, we had the bills and the wee wills, these little aliens who could fight each other in the game and so on. And the wow. sort of, but in that case, we were looking at something different, which was the extent to which a feature of bell speed was actually going to be borrowed into wee wills speed. So we were looking at a certain sense under which that would happen. But we did find it was. Uh, what you call if you're interested. What we did, we didn't. We, what we did find was there's very little accommodation by the big tough aliens who were not. We were not expecting to borrow from the wee wills in that direction. Um, I think we would expect if we set things up in the certain kind of way. I think we would expect this accommodation. I think that's absolutely something we expect. I also have some early work from 2010 with an artificial language game where we got um, an initially homogeneous language, which we found about, turned it um, split into two dialects of the cross experiment based on there being two teams which were competing against each other. There were some other things going on there, so it wasn't purely disaccommodation, right. but certainly I think there are ways to find, get that to happen in artificial language. So one of the follow-ups that various people have done is do people, when they see people accommodating to, the, to each other, uh, you would judge them as liking each other better than that? I mean, this is, there's another person here at Yale who seems to have done a bunch of that stuff. In, he's in another department. So, 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 so the question is, would, you, would we judge them as likely? Yeah, sort of like like possibly. I don't know. I mean, I think yes, to, to a extent. I think there are circumstances in which you get this relationship between positive affiliation and um, convergence, absolutely. Um, on the other hand, I think you, uh, you, you're going to find other things going on, right? That you might like each other personally, say, but there are reasons why you might not accommodate to the same extent, or you might accommodate for perhaps other reasons. Are there, are there good examples of that? I'm trying to think of. <laughs> there's a sort of example I remember hearing about, which I thought was rather nice in this context, but it's not coming to mind. But, um, but I mean, the question is about if you feel. So if you have a situation where, for instance, I guess, it's not the time I have mind, where you are aligned in some way, like right? you are cooperating, you're a. You're, um, you're cooperating, you're going in the same direction. You pro if you really get on well, we probably expect there's probably going to be more accommodation than um, taking into account that there's going to be individual variation. On the other hand, I think you should expect a certain amount of accommodation just because you're aligning along the same task and trying to align along the same task regardless of your personal feeling. So I'd be wary of saying necessarily that in the same way we didn't see the relationship between success overall and alignment, I'd be wary of predicting that we necessarily see a relationship between personal feelings about each other and um, accommodation. But there's something along the lines of how well you feel affiliated. Thank you. Uh, it's a question for Chelsea. Um, so you were um, testing for perceptual discrimination between the homophone pairs. Um, and you have them produced by different speakers, um, so you're, you're asking for people to make, uh, to, to be perceptually accurate on distinction. And I, I was just wondering what would happen if you flipped that, and if instead you played people uh, two um, signals, the same word, uh, the two signals produced by the same speaker, who's either producing the same word twice, or they're producing the homophone pair, uh, and then ask them, um, is this the same recording? Is this actually the same recording you're hearing twice? And it could be that in all cases it's not, but it might be like really hard to, to tell if it's the if there's actually a difference in the homophones, it should be easier to tell that those aren't two instances of the same recording than if it's um, if it's the um, if it's just the actual verbatim reproduction of the same word. 
uh, so it's just it's amusing. Like you could flip it and 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 ask for judgments of identity yeah. rather than judgments. I mean, of people people tend to be pretty good at basically judging identity of two recordings. Well, I think I think possibly not. If in an experiment, if you ask people the question, is it is it this or is it not this? There's going to be an expectation that every now and then they're going to get a trial where it's not. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're yeah. actually, yeah. And, or you could you could also make it a little more difficult by um, uh, having I don't know have, distracting or, or somehow adding to the cognitive burden a little bit. But um, so yeah, I haven't tried that with homophones. I did something uh, sort of uh, about how capitalization influences prosody uh, and gave people paired things from the same speaker and basically ask, you know, which of these two paired items was the one that was capitalized. People did way better than chance before, like, in their mid-50s. Uh, but then if you switch them to a new speaker, they were back at zero, or back at 50. So, I, hmm, I'm not sure what I would predict for homophones. Like, assuming that they are, do have some of these memories of details, like, I think you would expect them to do better than chance if you have them getting the same speed where then the issue is they, I mean, I think that still is consistent with that these aren't part of the representation, we just sort of recognize this is how this speaker is saying this word, and it doesn't really predict anything about how another speaker is going to say these two words. Because mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. we have to do both, right? I mean, in real life, we have right. to tell when a word is not the same, is different from another word that might have been said, but also when it's the same. I mean, so the, and those two judgments might not actually be sort of mirror images of each other. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. Oh, question no. so, um, I was thinking about for Lacey about why we found that it facilitates uh, and you did not. Uh, and I thought maybe it's because so uh, your people accommodated in, in one Part. So you told them there could be an F or a P, and that's a simple category. Maybe it's that because uh, our they have to do it on, on more than one aspect of language of, of the language. Maybe if you have more information, you can <coughs> accommodate it more. That is more helpful to facilitate it. That's about the only thing I could come up with. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, that could be, I think th th there is a lot going on there, I mean, go back to your questions. It's a, it's a somewhat impoverished setup. There's only one thing that varies in the dialect, you know, the social um, situation is rather impoverished, etc. But on, so I think that may well be part of it. On the other hand, I also think there's a difference with the marketplace, that you really have two people who are trying to sell to each other, yes. trying to buy it, a very transactional <coughs> setup where you really want someone to do, do something that's, it's not exactly that they're at odds with each other, because they might, they might well be a mutually beneficial outcome, but if they're not cooperating in quite the same way as they were here, where they cooperate on the task, and everyone is trying quite hard to mm -hmm. do the same thing, and it doesn't really matter if the person you're interacting with sounds like someone, sounds like you say. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas in your case, it probably does help a bit if the person talks to you in your own language. Definitely, or, yeah, it's, it's definitely more helpful than so, maybe they try to show the positive face and. Uh, oh, sorry, and don't want to show the negative face because they want to uh, have a successful communication because they have a reason for it. And maybe they can't the case. Yeah, I think that may well be a big, a big part of it. And it might be rather interesting to set up a sort of um, virtual market, let's say, where you have that. I think that would yeah, be rather nice. Definitely, I was talking about that I was in the conference a few weeks before uh, some guys from the Max Planck Institute in Nijmegen. They presented their new uh, virtual setup for where you can you know, have interlocutors and have them look right a certain way. So that would, but I think it, it would be too expensive. I mean, if I ever can R at the Max Planck, I would do it. But I, I think if I go to the University of Potsdam and say, oh, please buy these three uh, projection stuffs and 3D, they say, yeah. Might <laughs> <laughs> not have to be three million. You might be able to do it for a lot smaller. So, right. uh, Jason? Uh, question for Chelsea. So, did I catch right that there was a, a negative coefficient for trial in the identification experiment? Yes. 
So, I mean, so that means you're getting worse at identifying homophones as the experiment goes on. Could you, do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, I, I think it might be that the experiment's sort of long and it's a sort of frustrating task, um, such that, I mean, so people, I think they basically are developing bad strategies because there's also, so there are uh, multiple blocks and they're getting the same pair, uh, the same items in each block. Mm -hmm. So it might be that they sort of think they've picked up on something but haven't yeah. actually. So like they're trying to use something and it's not just that they've, it's not helping, it's that it's actually making it worse. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a sort of surprising thing. Like you would expect that they would learn these and get better, but they aren't getting any feedback, so they don't really have evidence for, did I guess right that previous time, or did I guess wrong? Because with, with respect to the conclusion that these phonetic differences aren't like represented with the homophones, I thought, well, if, if they are represented with the homophones, but then you have other stuff, other stuff going on, you have to adapt to, say, the individual talkers, other stuff going on in the context of the experiment, then you might expect them to do better at the beginning than, than at the end. So maybe that maybe hmm. maybe the um, maybe the, your idea of feedback maybe that's that's interesting. What would you expect if you gave them some feedback on correct answers a little bit to help them along? Yeah, could we train them away? into this? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, in production, so I'm currently doing um, a convergence study where basically you're trying to train people into shifted characteristics where you're getting different words shifted in different ways, mm -hmm. and in their immediate shadowing of context, you get it. And then once you test them again at the end, you get nothing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, at least in production, I, you seem to not be able to get that sort of training, but I'm not sure in perception, maybe you could like get people to associate, like try to strengthen up those associations. I'm not sure. Um, just to follow up, sorry. In the regulation model, there was a variable called contrast type. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? So that's about, um, so in the trials where they were two phonologically distinct items, where within the word was it? And so it consistently was a case that contrast type C was significant and O was not significant. Right, what so. Was, uh, what does O stand for? Onset and coda are the ones you're looking at and they're being compared to the nucleus. What's your like hypothesis as to why there's this asymmetry between these? So for the response times, I think a lot of it is basically if in the distinct trials you have to wait till the end of the word to know if they're distinct, then even when they're the same, you're still waiting to the end of the word to tell. So you know the onset right at the beginning, you also know the vowel pretty close to the beginning because you don't need to listen to the whole vowel to know what the vowel is. Uh -huh. But in order to hear the concept, uh, the, the coda, you have to have waited through the whole vowel so you get that response time difference. And that there's core articulation effects. You'll get right. articulation effects on the vowel often. Right. So, but still, like, you have to wait through a lot of the vowel before you're getting that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's still, I think that's the, mostly what we're getting. Um, oh. Yeah. Yes. Just to tie on to the conversation about where you could sort of train people to distinguish the uh, homophonous meaning, um, I think the finding in, in, is that parents do this spontaneously. So, uh, Aaron Carmel, uh, Google. Um, yeah, so like parents will, it's something to do with where like they, I think maybe lengthen the lower frequency homophone, um, but yeah, they're acoustically distinguishable, I think. Um, but yeah, so that's like, it's interesting because like that's the kind of case where there's like a lot of incentive to teach. Um, and so I guess all you would have to do to get people to do this in production consistently is like, have them talk to a child or something. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it would be interesting. I mean, I guess the evidence suggests that just in normal, real life, people are not actively doing this in the same way across different speakers. But yeah, I mean, like you can train people on new words. So there's no reason you can't just deform two words and teach people, yeah, this is now how we say these two things. And they're now distinct. Like we can also learn, you know, if we have different mergers and someone else has a different dialect that doesn't have a merger that you have. You know, some people are better than those at actually picking up on, oh, you actually have these distinct and I can use that. Like some people aren't as good at that, but, so I think, I mean, I think we would definitely predict that you can do this, um, and it's just a question of how you'd have to set it up to get people to accept that you're teaching them 
basically you're trying to teach them, oh yeah, these aren't homophones. And if you, I don't know, what you would predict about things like, can you do it if they're spelled the same and then you're just associating them with pictures? Does it have to align with our expectations of, of frequency or can you get them to oppose what we'd sort of by default expect and so on? But, yeah, it'd be interesting if someone wants to do that. They, I think it probably would work. Um, I just wanted to sort of take a broader look um, at just sort of what we sort of have in common here, just like the relationship between meaning and phenology. Where do you think it exactly is? So there's sort of this relationship between social meaning and phenology and like identity and things like that, but then there's also this sort of arbitrary thing that people also, as you said, seem to want to make into a real relationship, like making homophones that are not actually related to each other be somehow conceptually related. Um, so yeah, so I just wondered if you guys could speak to what you think the relationship is, how it is influencing sound change. Um, sort of <laughs> I suppose one thing is, uh, which connects to some other talks, is people, I mean, people are trying to make the sounds that they're producing work for them. They're trying to make them work for the kind of community tasks they're trying to achieve, by so. Mm -hmm. So it's um, actually they try, you know, they, they have this community task, but they also have some sort of social task going on in parallel, like mm -hmm. right? whatever that task might be. And we, every day, you know, we, we do the same thing. When we interact with people, we have these kind of social um, tasks, or whatever we're called, that we're doing. And we make the sounds kind of, to some extent, serve that, whether consciously or unconsciously. And I think you have the same sort of thing happening here to some extent, right? You have these different, the same sort of story, you have these different um, meanings in a more semantic sense. And you have the sounds are to some extent, not necessarily conscious, or probably not consciously, being made to serve the commutative tasks that people are putting them to. And I don't know if that may, there may be a sort of connection there, because people are doing things with words, and that in doing so, they make the sounds are sort of bending to the kind of meaning the social. Yeah, so I mean, my task is sort of the opposite of yours, and then it's like very, very non-social, very unnatural. Um, but it seems like, at least in the first one, we're getting this effect of basically lexical ambiguity, that people are trying to anticipate what's being communicated and trying to uh, basically handle what they're expecting from the speaker, even when it's framed as something that you can do purely phonologically. If you're doing it purely phonologically, it doesn't actually matter if you happen to know that sun has two possible meanings. Um, so, so it does seem like a lot of it's trying to anticipate what you're getting from your interlocutor. It isn't about production for your interlocutor. Um, it's about sort of what you think that person is um, giving you or in this sort of task. Like they know that some of these are going to be different. Maybe they're thinking, oh, I ought to be hearing a difference. So they start guessing about that. So. so you know, to some extent, we distinguish between sun and sun in contexts where it's blindingly obvious we don't mean, so this is my sun, I don't mean, <laughs> this is my star. Well, <laughs> this is a little thing, you know what I mean? It's yeah. blind, pretty much blindly obvious most of the time, as you said, that these are what the difference between mean is, and yet we still, to some extent, might distinguish them um, uh, phonetically. And I think the similar sort of thing, there's an interesting parallel there with what found my spell, that people even though they don't really need to be used to accommodate, it doesn't seem to be helping them do anything necessarily. But the, the, you know, the main task that they have to, to do is move around the map. Um, it's not doing anything for that, but people seem to be doing these things in parallel with some interesting, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah, I actually had a question about basically automaticity, because when we think about basically phonetic accommodation in speech, usually it's something that we think can probably happen sort of automatically, but for you it's definitely something that's more of a decision, at least in some level, because you know whether you've typed a P or an F, but then to what extent you think this is still basically automatic, that you've just seen someone give you an F, so you're more likely to write that, versus are you really thinking, I'm going to type an F for you? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think we do, I mean, we do this in typing a bit, right? So if you're in some messaging friends, you're influenced a bit by what they recently typed, you automatically maybe type in specifically, but I agree that people are sort of maybe more conscious of what they're doing here. We may be, there may be sort of effect which is slightly parasitic on the fact that this is an artificial language they've just learned, so there's a bit of uncertainty about what they might already have typed and what, they, mm. what the other person might be doing. Um, so, yeah, it's a, good, it's a good question, which I think I don't want to 
don't know if I really have more to say than that, apart from that, yes, absolutely. There's this sort of weird, not quite automatic, not quite, um, not quite conscious sciences. So, so, you know, we did ask participants what they thought they were doing. They thought this was really about the math task, and she'd get the math mm. done right, probably done right, and so on. But, yeah, I don't, I don't have a very good answer. I'm interested to investigate that more. I have a question for Gary. Did you have a condition where um, a player was told that they would be playing with someone from their own species? That was the same species. So we had for all the no expectation classes, they always thought they were talking, they always thought the other species. For the no for the explicit expectation expectation participants, they were told they would be speaking with someone from their own species. Because okay. I was thinking that you know, partly we have expectations about when we're, when we're, we're newly engaging with someone linguistically, we have expectations about uh, if we think that, that we belong to the same language community, that, that we're going to be the same yeah. on many, many measures up to some point of sort of individual variation. Whereas we have expectations that if we, we believe we belong to different language communities, that there, there should be readily apparent some differences, some linguistic differences. Otherwise, why did you bother to tell me that I'm a green bit and that person is a whatever, <laughs> yeah, or whatever? Uh, so, so it could be like there could be these strong, and I guess you built that into your design. I, 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 I was no, but yeah, uh, absolutely. But I was thinking of a uh, an interesting um, thesis that was just done at Northwestern. Someone was looking at exactly this question in uh, where the dependent variable was speech errors, which are never intentional, uh -huh. right? And so they were asking whether you're going to be more likely to learn the phonotactics, to be attending to the phonotactics of a speaker producing nonsense words. If you, uh, it, it, you're going to be more likely to notice divergences in the phonotactic if you think that that person belongs to a different uh -huh. linguistic community. And then tracking those phonotactics, they come out in your own speech errors. Whereas if you think that that person belongs to the same linguistic community, you're not bothering to track the phonotactics tactics so that that the features aren't changed. So this was Tommy Tommy Denby's dissertation. The last name. The last name is Denby. Okay. Um, but it just speaks to this issue of you know we're going to be have expectations for differences and be looking for them. Yeah, them. yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that's a good point. That's a, that's a very important point. I mean, I think as I mean, said, we had the sort of comparison between the different um, phases. I think. One thing I found striking was we did find they did seem to when they had the expectations frustrated, they didn't get the F, they got the V. There did seem to be something happening, but they were really not quite sure how to proceed. And they had this dampening effect later where they it's where they didn't accommodate or converge the same extent as they had. So that person earlier wasn't on. reliable, their partner wasn't yeah. a reliable representative. Even though they thought we, we tried to we tried to convince them whether or not they believed that the person they were interacting with was another reader. Mm -hmm. Rather than the same individual, but of course, in this kind of situation, well, maybe all these three bits are weird. <laughs> you know, it's not clear whether that really makes much of a difference. Um, but yeah, no, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a it's a very good point that there is a sort of expectation. Really, who knows what they're going to do? But still, within that, we have this um, interesting frustration. The same question could be asked at Chelsea: that um, take take your experiment and do it with have British speakers, but American subjects. And many of the American subjects aren't going to know whether son and son are pronounced exactly the same in British English the way they would have been in American English, I'm say. So they're looking, in the way Jennifer is suggesting, they're looking for something, and they're more attentive to the phonotactics. Yeah. I mean, we, I guess, I think we probably would predict lower accuracy. Uh, particularly for the homophones, because people are saying, well, maybe those are distinct for British speakers. Yeah. Um. I've lived with a British speaker for years, and I've never understood any of them. <laughs> <laughs>